Uh, well, <laughs> thanks uh, to the participants for, for the thoughts and remarks and whatever presentations. Uh, it was so rich. I mean, I, I was trying to think and to, to put things together. Uh, I agreed with a lot of what was said, but I disagreed here and there, but mildly, of course. Uh, it makes it difficult for me to respond on the spot because simply of the complexity of what was said. So I, I, I ask for, I am apologizing that I won't respond to every point. I simply cannot, uh, although I took ample notes. Um, let me go systematically starting with Dan's remarks, then Paul, and then Mark. Uh, Dan really spoke a lot about the relation between uh, memory and history uh, in historiography and in, uh, in what is the desirable, uh, possibly the desirable way of, of mixing those separate entities uh, or of having them both close but yet controlling each other. Um, uh, Dan, as you know, but almost as well as I, I do, um, uh, all this thinking about memory, and indeed I, uh, I participated in the uh, memory boom, if I may say, which I regret to a point. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, you may remember an article by Charles Mayer uh, some years ago, saying that there was a, a surplus of memory. And I almost agreed, although I didn't tell him, of course, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would be cutting the branch on which I was sitting, in part. But uh, uh, this memory has gone sometimes uh, wild, uh, mostly in in the reconstructions of the events via the mass media. I mean, this is a problem which you haven't touched enough, maybe, and which is a problem for, for all of us who want to, to see a kind of rapprochement between strict history and the integration of elements of memory uh, as a, uh, I wouldn't say natural, uh, uh, meeting, but something that is desirable also ethically, as you, you pointed out. But unfortunately, mass media have uh, used constructions of the past, which you may call uh, public memory or whatever. Uh, after all, nobody limits that memory to, to written text. I mean, uh, film and so on and so forth, mostly film is what now creates an artificial and mostly false memory among the wider, uh, the wider audiences, let's say, including, by the way, uh, uh, kids at school, and that will be the problem I will address in a moment. Now, let's, in a way, leave aside the difficulty of of dealing with both domains. My intention in, in the years of extermination, I don't speak now of the memoir or of writing about, that all is years back. But uh, the, the intention in the years of extermination was not so much to recreate a factual memory, and that will bring me later to, to Mark's remarks, but to try to give the reader some kind of feeling for the reactions of the witnesses as caught on the moment in order to create that sense of disbelief, not by my own comments, uh, 
uh, Goldhag intended to do that, and it was effective, but I would shy away from this. Uh, but by, the, by, historic, by introducing historical elements, after all, uh, diaries are something that, and I was very careful. I saw diaries about Hungary, for example, which clearly, in, to my mind, had been rewritten. Um, in diaries of survivors of post-war, uh, I mean, published after the war by their authors. I, I, can, I could tell it. And um, that will bring me to the, fact, to the witness as expert, because often the expert uh, is no witness. I mean, I understand what you meant, and uh, that is the, the, the witness if the witness survived, you often wonder what, uh, how much the memory has been then uh, reshaped, although it's a diary, but uh, I will come to that. In any case, the, the problem of, uh, for historians, and now I take myself out of that community for a moment, for historians like Martin Brochard, was, well, the memory of the victims, I mean, I'm quoting him almost textually, uh, is a mythic memory. I mean, the victim, by the very nature of the survivor, right? Uh, we, uh, the, the, somebody who survived uh, the war, or the community, I added, that is the sons and daughters, or uh, whatever, relatives of the Jews in general, cannot really be expected to deal objectively and rationally with that past because their whole perception of it is mythical. And he introduced before in that same article uh, the deformations created by the mass media, that is film mainly, at the very beginning of that article. And of course, the, where do the films come from? from Hollywood and uh, Jewish media and so on and so forth. So it was a loaded article uh, about the historicization and the inability of the victims to really uh, speak objectively of the past, which uh, led me to ask him whether people who had been as he had been, I didn't know he had been in the party, but as he had been in the Hitler youth and so were not subjective on their side, uh, which led to that tension uh, uh, in the correspondence, which of course was unavoidable. Now, what may be, what I would wish to answer is your quote of, uh, um, of Goldberg, among others, who said, well, I mean, the argument I, I, I grasped when I read his comments was well, those voices, they are known by now. They are really common, uh, uh, kind of common uh, knowledge for all who, those who read this literature. And they certainly do not, cannot uh, trigger the sense of disbelief because, because we, we, we have read it many times. And uh, what they can do is to create a kind of nostalgia, right? This argument, well, this is not serious. We should introduce analysis in a way instead of this kind of uh, recapturing voices which we have heard many times. Well, I was astonished, I must say. I know that Amos Goldberg is a specialist, has written a, at least his dissertation on, on this topic. I, um, uh, read it at the time, and um, uh, these voices are not known. Some of them are iconic, like Anne Frank and so on. Most of you, of course, have read all that, but these voices have been almost evacuated from the Jewish memory uh, of the events by the fact that they have been so universalized Etty Hillesum in the Netherlands. And mm -hmm. So that uh, Amos' argument uh, has maybe uh, some element of, uh, in my opinion, uh, is right on the fact that some of the voices are, have, been, 
have turned into iconic texts. But many of them, and I quoted one yesterday, I think, Ellen Baer and others, are just being discovered, published, and they create, this, if you read through them, suddenly you are, you are shocked by elements which you didn't expect. And uh, I think this is true for most readers of most of this contemporary uh, witnessing. Now, why insist on it? Why, I mean, I, I regret, as maybe more than many, the boom in memory, because the boom will crash. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think this is good for any, and of course, the, there are critics which are, uh, I would say, almost politically motivated, who say, well, you know, this is created artificially to justify then political demands, and so on and so forth. What is the issue which I would have liked you to address more thoroughly, but maybe I didn't catch it enough, is the ethical demand of memory. Now, again, you cannot force memory. You can hope for memory. And I always, when we discuss that, think of the monument or more, the monuments to the dead, let's say in France, again, country I know well, or in Germany, where uh, in the 20s and the 30s, each 11th of November and on other occasions, you had processions in each village, you have a monument or more in France, let's stick to France, uh, probably in England as well. Uh, so each 11th of November to, to commemorate the 11th of November 1918 and all the dead of World War I, there were pros processions really of pacifists, of nationalists, whatever, they lived the past in an absolutely immediate way. That is, the monument was the center of the village practically, like the church had been maybe some time before today. Those monuments are there, and some names are added for World War II, but basically uh, there are no more processions. It's a, you s maybe this will revive, I don't know, because I see a lot of British series mm. on, on World War II at least, and probably uh, the, the World War I will come back, but the fact is that the monuments as places of uh, ritual commemoration uh, barely visited anymore. At least uh, some of you may have another experience, but that's my feeling. So uh, the, the boom of World War I memory, which was, but which was very authentic, then because of World War II and the events uh, like the ones discussed here, in a way it seemed too far away and less relevant. Of course, some of it may have moved into the memory of World War II. Uh, that is, it may be now a, a memory of the two world wars. I don't know. But of course, there is the possibility of this up and down. And I sometimes, worry about it personally because I think it will be uh, it will be personally but that won't last very long but it will be collectively it will be we will not uh, uh, benefit in any way from forgetting I mean some people say now enough is enough forget about the traumatic events I think this the traumatic, the remembrance of traumatic events carries an ethical imperative. That is, it, 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 extreme events, and I don't speak only of the Holocaust, but uh, in that uh, we are speaking of the Holocaust here, but let's say Rwanda or uh, genocide for the Armenian community and many more people in where uh, we live, uh, Los Angeles, where there is a large Armenian community, the genocide of the Armenians is a presence. It inspires the, the present of the community and of much wider 
uh, groups of people and uh, it often comes together with uh, the Holocaust. So I see very well why for a community and for the wider than humanity, uh, the memory is an imperative. Uh, there is a very good book by Abishai Margalit mm -hmm. on the ethics mm -hmm. of memory, and I would recommend some of you who are interested in those problems. You have the vulgarization of memory, and that is, you can't do a thing about it, but it's a try to see again Holocaust, in quotes, the NBC miniseries, which created such, such desire for information. Those who criticize it, and I would count myself among them, but hesitantly, it's a Hollywood production, a pure Hollywood production, but of 1987. It was broadcast in 1987, if I'm not... 78. 78. 78, I'm sorry. Uh, 87, 78. I'm a little bit dyslexic. Uh, so, uh, 78, of course. Uh, it, it created, actually, it pushed the scholarship about the historical scholarship to a new degree. People were demanding books and studies and answers. It was a Hollywood production. So even these are not necessarily absolutely uh, mistaken expressions. But of course, this is a fabricated memory which then you may discuss Schindler's List, and this is maybe more uh, already somewhat more present in the minds of some of you, and so on and so forth. And uh, the film you mentioned, which I had, uh, had not heard of, and uh, wonder whether that uh, remembering those constructions has an uh, ethical purpose. But in general terms, and we can't go into it, and I cannot go into it, there is a, I, that's my feeling, there is a kind of imperative of remembering and, and there is no nostalgia, there is, a, uh, there is maybe for some, but in uh, general terms I would say that much of what is carried by the witnesses as auth more authentic, uh, witnesses also who mostly perished, is uh, often very new for the general reader and necessarily new because new, uh, some of those diaries are coming up every, uh, every year practically. Mm -hmm. uh, you may wonder how they come up. For example, the diary of Ellen Baer, whom I mentioned yesterday, was simply kept by the family, but one sees that they didn't touch it. And uh, as they were old people dying, no children, they gave it to uh, the foundation for the memory of the the Holocaust in France, and immediately it was published and extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Now that leads me to a problem which has been addressed by uh, everybody actually in the panel. What is the criterion uh, of authenticity, if you wish, of those diaries? This is very difficult because you, I would say, uh, Mark, because uh, it goes counter in a sense, your theory of the witness as expert, that it's more the contradictions and the fuzziness of what is written than, uh, than the coherence of it. Uh, for example, if you take a very famous diary, the one written by Victor Klemperer, a German, uh, a German Jew converted to, to Protestantism, uh, married to a Protestant German wife. Therefore, he almost, well, he survived, but he was almost deported at the very last moment in 45, mind you. Just before the end of the war, he was summoned by the local Gestapo to get on the train to Theresienstadt, of course. He lived in Dresden, and the bombing of Dresden put an end to it. They fled uh, to, to the west, and the Americans arrived. So even at the very last moment, he was summoned for deportation. But his diaries, which are fantastic, which I recommend there in English, are full of contradictions. He says one thing at one page and then 
10 pages later, <laughs> you have a contrary impression. And you sense that this is authentic. He, <coughs> he hadn't the time, nor the desire, nor uh, he had the honesty to keep things as they were and not re, uh, rearrange them, although he survived for, he was then professor in Berlin, East Berlin, that is, under the communist regime, he could have rewritten many things, he did not. So, we'll come to that expertise. Um, Dan, I'm sorry that I, there are many things you say <laughs> that I cannot really even read very quickly. <laughs> so, That's quite a that substantial okay? response. All right. <laughs> now, Paul. I mean, I was fascinated by the program you developed, and we I told you in a few words already my feeling. You are demanding something or creating something, your uh, foundation or uh, center, which is much beyond what school, uh, I, I, now I speak from my American experience, but I think that except for an Israeli experience, and even that today would be closer to an American experience. Maybe the British kids in high schools are so advanced <laughs> that your program uh, really answers the needs of high school children, allow me to say. And they usually do, if they demand anything, apart from the perpetrator history because it gives them some kind of, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but many, I mean, I have students, not anymore, I retired, but I had hundreds of them sitting, and I always wondered why do they come mm. to the classes on, the, on Nazi Germany? And I was sure without ever checking it, nor trying to even go closer to it, that part of them, let's say 5%, maybe 10% came because the, they like to, they, they in a way identified without ever saying it, mm -hmm. but it gave them a kick to, to see the whole thing. And the, the image which comes from the film of Leni Riefenstahl, Triumph des Willens, mm -hmm. uh, which you showed as the first image, uh, of course they want to see the film and the film creates a kind of uh, um, interest which often is not distanced. You are dealing with youngsters, also undergraduates, which are not, which don't, in my opinion, have the critical distancing, enabling them to look at the various aspects and to integrate complexity. Now, I may be completely wrong on that, because, again, the, the <laughs> schools here may be much better, and I hope they are, but, uh, <laughs> But you may want to say to us later on, you are doing now, I understand, a research on student response, that is on the pupils' response. We are all very curious to see that because it may be very different from what you expect and you may see that they want the tears eventually, uh, whoever they are, or they get a kind of strange, uh, uh, let's say, thrill uh, of the, what they see, or they, or they don't care one way or the other. <laughs> I mean, uh, let's be completely honest about this. Speaking to a 16-year-old, right? That's more or less target you 14, are at. 14, 15, 16. 14, 15, mm -hmm. well, not Californians, <laughs> not Californians. <laughs> they would be thinking of surfing and certainly not of <laughs> of complexity, of historical uh, representation. So, I mean, I could go point by point about what you said, and it's a marvelous program. But I think you are aiming much too high, and that uh, only experience will show. Now, uh, the, the um, victim as expert, I mean, uh, Mark is right, and I, uh, your first book was a proof that you are right, because much of what I forgot now the name of the, Marianne. With, yeah, of Marianne, uh, told was not known, of course, and she gave us quite, I mean, I remember some parts of her testimony 
in extraordinary clarity, also I read this uh, when you published it, and one thing struck me as terrible, and I wouldn't have, I, I could have figured it out, but actually reading it, she is, uh, the family was wealthy and uh, very wealthy, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they were in uh, touch with important people in Essen, right? And um, therefore, uh, they were brought to the deportation buses, but then, because of intervention, they were taken back to their home. But in, uh, as others were, were getting to the buses, and you said, or she said, and you, that the, she heard a howl of protest, in a way, of anger from those who were being sent uh, away. That is the, the resentment about somebody being saved, God knows for how that person did it, but being saved, coming from those who didn't yet know they were doomed, but were, knew that they were going to a terrible life in any case, that I think is a moment of truth which is difficult to, to imagine when you uh, don't read it and it fits, it fits. But um, those memories are, uh, and she's an exception because also she, uh, she quotes a letter she got from, uh, uh, from her fiancé uh, via an SS man. Uh, and indeed, it's one of the documents about the, the, the assembly place where he was in Galicia, which is astonishing. So, Yes, your uh, survivor was, in a way, an expert. But this is not the case of a great majority of them. That is, there is a colleague of ours called uh, uh, Langer, I forgot now his first name. Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah. Hmm? Lawrence. Lawrence. Yes. Uh, who uh, spoke of superficial memory mm -hmm. and deep mm -hmm. memory. And the, the question is, of course, and, and you see that on the video interviews. Most of those video interviews are not good, not because the survivors do not know how they could express themselves. They do, but because the interviewers don't know enough about what they are asking, and therefore they don't take the lead which the interviewee gives them by answering something which should immediately be seized. They simply don't. There is one good collection, the Yale uh, archive, the one, the, the foundation for the Shoah in Los Angeles is, is much, is immense, but uh, uh, not really, I think, very useful. But what Langer says, and is so, I think, deeply interesting for all of us, that if the interviewee speaks long enough and is pushed, as in Lanzmann's film, which you may have seen, seen uh, from all angles, suddenly the deeper memory comes out, kind of chaos coming to the surface, and that, is the, that, that carries some emotional truth, which may not necessarily be factual truth, because it's too chaotic, or it may be useful, uh, at some points, but uh, you have to always think that whoever answers the questions, and we have that with the post-war, immediate post-war testimonies, Border, whom you mentioned, these are people who first tell a story which they have rehashed in their minds. Uh, that's why I always used witnesses who, mostly who perished and who on the spot wrote what they saw. And then they couldn't really very much reprocess the, that in their mind, they, they were gone. Uh, but in any case, those who had time to rethink have a kind of superficial memory which is coherent, which is coherent. You have really to push them, suddenly the incoherence of the deeper memory comes up. And I think that's, uh, that's crucial. So, all right, in some cases, the witness is an expert. But uh, think also of the witnesses that 
are not experts because either this, they, they, they offer you a, a, a coherent story but which they constructed for their own, uh, because of their own traumatic needs, uh, or uh, f uh, because they heard collectively what was being said, and that's the problem with uh, uh, Chris Browning's uh, marvelous book. Um, uh, I, and that's why I think those witnesses are important as immediate voices expressing an immediate emotion in the face of events. They don't tell you so much about the events because the, the events are very often uh, similar, but suddenly they, they confront them in individual ways and they express the terror or the hope or the rumors or whatever, which gives you a sense of the uh, of this world in its density of of events told by the historians and of emotions uh, expressed uh, by the by the witness. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like to see if anyone from the floor has some questions that they'd like to ask so we have a roving mic is there or ask also the panelists yes, because they really yeah. brought the yeah. mass of uh, yeah. and, and the panel too well would you like to go ahead Paul go ahead yeah uh, let me ask two questions uh, you mentioned in your first lecture, the apologies or the projects that have been done by banks and so on, what do you think of apologies being given by institutions? Um, do they have a constructive role in contributing to the understanding of what had happened? Or is this a sort of whitewashing of the past uh, done on the basis of very, very cheap uh, single lump sum compensation, so they're bought cheaply, like yeah. the foundation for yeah. memory compensation in the future. That's one thing I would like to ask you. That is the apologies by banks, by industries. Yeah. Well, I think you know the answer. The apology, I mean, first they, they have to pay a rather big sum, and that is what really is painful. And then they <laughs> say, well, we are really sorry, but nobody believes them. And uh, I consider this as pure hypocrisy. I mean, that the Swiss banks would apologize to the victims is pretty unlikely. I'm sorry to be so negative, but I was in the commission dealing with the banks, it so happens, that is dealing with the relations between Switzerland and the Nazi Reich during the whole 33, 45 period the Bergier Commission. There was another commission dealing specifically only with the financial aspect. This was uh, headed by an ex-chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, but ours was historical and international, that is, it was not a Swiss commission. And uh, we discovered, I think, many things because the, the Swiss government had agreed, I mean, on the demand of the Swiss parliament to open the archives. But the point is that once we, the re reports were published and th there was a main report and then some 18 volumes of specific issues, pretty bad, the, 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 the professor, the Swiss professor, who was in charge of the commission and who was really of an old Swiss family colonel in the Swiss army, which means a lot in Switzerland, and so on, professor of economic history in Lausanne and then in Zurich, was ostracized, mm. was considered as, uh, as really a traitor. He died a year ago, uh, and I asked uh, somebody who was very close to him, was he a bitter person at the end? He said, Yes, he was a bitter person, because suddenly, instead of being thanked for having done this, uh, this work of coming into terms with the past, mm. 
He was rejected as somebody, who, Swiss colonel and so on, had uh, headed the commission bringing up. So that's the answer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the other question which I have relates to that because I use in my research on victims of human experiments, many of whom survived, narratives of victims from compensation documents. And the narratives, although the document may sometimes just give a small box, people write pages and pages and pages about what happened to them. Uh, I work, for example, with uh, documents held by the United Nations Human Rights Commission, which is not a used source, but there are 1,800 um, individual uh, files that I analyzed. And it seems to me that what they wrote is really I can say, these are victims as experts. These would seem to me to be, although they're written ostensibly for compensation, but they are actually testifying as to start? what happened yeah. to them about topics which one may not know that much about in the published and literature. And that goes in the direction of, of course, what Mark uh, For example, experiments with mescaline, which is actually extremely interesting because it's about truth. So that's what I would... No, no doubt that Mark, I mean, uh, my criticism was, very, uh, was only very partial. I mean, something you didn't mention, uh, which occurs to me now, and will, uh, I am sure everybody will understand that. One of the, the themes that nobody has touched until very recently, until uh, Chris Browning came up with those with the testimonies in his book on the work camp, is sexual uh, uh, exploitation, uh, exploitation, uh, rape and whatever, uh, or uh, brothels, where the victims uh, were serving the SS and so on, and women who survived this would not, of course, tell that story. And only now that some of them have uh, pretty old, mm. they are ready to, to speak. And that, I think, is an example of the victim as expert, uh, and that ties also to what you say. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it goes both ways. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Hi, I just want to um, ask what do you think about the role of the German people and how Hitler's um, Nazi ideology affected their behavior and their subsequent memories of the events? How the Germans remembered the events? Yeah, and how Hitler's how ideology they were affected. influenced at the time? Yeah. Both, that yeah. is. Well, <laughs> that's <small> huge, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> shall we have two, three, four more hours? <laughs> But uh, in, um, I, uh, you know, the common thing you heard if you were uh, visiting Germany at the time and until late, uh, the theme was we didn't know. We didn't know. Uh, yes, the propaganda and uh, the, the Hitler, uh, the Führer and so on, negative, I mean all that, but about the atrocities, uh, nobody knew. And slowly but surely, over the last 15 years, I would say, correct me if I'm wrong on, uh, on the historiography, but uh, 20 years at most, so research after research showed that the population knew much more than they admitted for several decades, and that actually the latest uh, book, Pfeiffer's book in German about his grandfather, but then checking the facts uh, uh, from various sources and comparing them with the memory of his, of his family, that about 25 to 30 million Germans knew about the extermination of the Jews as it happened and understood it. Because you see, one of the earliest theses, not knowing was the basics. But then a historian called Walter Lacoeur came with a very interesting book, The Terrible Secret. It's a book of 1980, stating that information there was. 
no question, but people couldn't grasp it, couldn't integrate, couldn't understand it. It was too, in a way, uh, uh, unbelievable to be really believed. But now all that is gone to the wind. I mean, it's clear that many also said, well, the bombings are just retaliation for what we did to the Jews. I mean, the Jews are now taking their revenge on us by, bom so why did we do that to the Jews? Now we are being bombed to rubble, and so on. It's, I mean, I have testimonies from, which I found in various archives, of people who, even at the end of 1941, which is pretty early, uh, knew what was happening to the members of their community in West, in the West, in Westphalia, in the western part of Germany. And we know that from the reports of the Nazi police, that is, they were reporting every two weeks about, uh, about what was being said in various regions and so on. And they said, well, many people say, yeah, the Jews are gone to the east. That was the deportations of late 41. And those who can work will be put to work in ex-Soviet factories, Soviet territory, and the others will be shot. So they didn't know exactly, but the population was uh, pretty clear that part of those of their own little town would work to death, actually, and the others would be shot on the spot. So the knowledge was there from very early on, and then it spread, it spread to the whole of Europe, at least the whole of Central and Eastern Europe, of course. Um, just like to thank you all for, on behalf of all of us for talking to us. Speak up. Sorry, um, my question would be is, in terms of memory, um, would you consider using the memory of perpetrators, in, and if there was much memory, um, how does it compare to the memory of victims, basically? Absolutely. I mean, I, we didn't speak much of it because, in a sense, we went to the, very much to the voice of the victims and so on. I actually use it in the volume mentioned uh, several times. And uh, it creates a strange effect. The, the, the perpetrator's texts or voices are, I mean, mainly letters from soldiers to their families. And one of them says, uh, uh, I mean, I have two quotes which come back because they are so, uh, so telling in a sense. One of them writes from uh, uh, a town in Eastern Poland. Uh, yesterday I arrived at uh, Ber Bertoszka Katusz. I don't remember the name of the town, it's a tiny town. 1,200 Jews have just been shot. Their uh, clothes have been disinfected and so on. Uh, they are also repairing parts which have been, uh, um, which have holes of the shooting and they will be then used uh, in the Reich. I mean, that is, the Jews have been shot and nothing is thrown away. We, will, we are re recycling. Uh, uh, the clothes. And then he says, I, I, I bet, I bet you that if this war goes on for a little while, the Jews will be turned into sausage and serve to Russian prisoners and eventually to Jewish specialists who will survive. That is, he makes fun. He says, we use everything. And you know what? There will be sausage meat and be distributed for, as food the other one says, well, uh, he arrives in Auschwitz, the town, not the camp, of course, on his way to the Eastern Front. And he says, here I am in Auschwitz. Again, he writes to the family. You see, how can you not know when you receive letters from, uh, and there were mm -hmm. millions of soldiers on the Eastern Front sending letters back to families. The Gestapo, the secret police, was extremely worried about these rumors created by soldiers who is a common fellow or simply write back. And he writes, here I am in Auschwitz. Jews arrive here eight, seven to 8,000 a week. 
And soon they will die a hero's death. That's in German, in German ein Heldentod, which is a, you know, operatic kind of. And he says, it's so good to see the world. I mean, this is a 19-year-old, 20-year-old soldier. So this flow of memories, uh, of memories, of letters and so, to the families created a collective knowledge, which then becomes a collective memory, if you wish, which is repressed. There is silence. There is for many years, but in the 50s, I mean, uh, in a book by Günther Grass, uh, The Dog's Years, I think, he says there is a club where you have to eat onion in order to have tears coming down your eyes because otherwise you cannot really cry. So it's a club where people are eating onions and then they, they weep. Um, uh, of course, this is sarcastic. The same Günther Grass, it now appears very recently that he was, uh, that, well, uh, some time ago that he had been in, in the waffen -SS and so on himself, and now he came out with all kinds of declarations. But that's not the point. The point is that this knowledge was repressed, that memory was there, but completely underground, and that slowly but surely, uh, one discovers that it was there, you see. Just uh, on the issue of um, the remembrances of uh, those from what some of be are beginning to term the perpetrator side, so perpetrators, collaborators, mm -hmm. witnesses, bystanders. Um, Dan and, and I are both involved in a, um, on an advisory capacity on a, a project which is um, interviewing um, witnesses from that time now and, uh, and gathering material. And uh, it, it can't be treated in the same way as um, survivor uh, testimony or survivor interviews. Um, it's it's uh, obviously a challenging set of material. You have to think about um, not only what is misremembered, but what people choose to leave out and how they try and perhaps justify but it's also surprising how many people are very willing to speak. Uh, I think many people have been shocked by how how many people are very willing and uh, in their old age. Yeah, and now, yeah, absolutely now. This is a, a program of um, of collection which is happening at a pace right now, mm -hmm. um, with an urgency because obviously this generation is passing. So um, that uh, that archive, I think it's, it hasn't really been decided quite how that archive will be used yet or how, how accessible it will be. Um, it's certainly not going to be made just publicly accessible straight away, but uh, there's, um, just that you know that there is a, a, some work being done now, um, very interesting work in collecting that kind of uh, interview. I don't know if Dan wants to add anything or that well, covers it. Just to say, I, mean, I suppose that the people who are involved are the, the very youngest in their late 80s and the oldest are well mm. over 100. Um, and some of the material is really eye-watering, as you can imagine. Uh, yeah. these, these people who um, sometimes are thoughtful and repentant, and in other cases mm. are absolutely still died in the wall Nazis, and, yeah. um, or even when they try not to be, still come out with unconsciously the same sorts of vocabulary and thought processes and frameworks from the Nazi period. It's really extraordinary to, to see this on camera. Can so, you give us an example? Um, an example. There's a, a one, maybe Paul can think of a better one. One of the ones that we've seen a few times is there's a, a, a well, a two Romanian uh, so called Volksdeutsche, so uh, ethnic Germans living in Romania, still living in Romania, who on camera sing, uh, these, these are men who must be 90 or so, on camera sing one of the SS marching songs about driving the knife into the belly of the Jew and so on. Uh, and I'm quite happy to sing it, and I think particularly because in, the, in their Romanian context, where there hasn't been the same um, long-term debate about the meaning of the past as there has been in Germany, they do this with a kind of pride that I think some of the interviewees in Germany and Austria are a little bit more circumspect. They, their pro-Nazi sympathies slip out despite themselves. But in some of the Eastern European countries, um, some of these people are still absolutely proud of what they did and, and are willing to to speak in that way, so it, it's, um, yeah, this is why we have to think very carefully about what's going to happen with this material, but it is, it, I think sooner or later, 
um, it will start to be available to, to scholars who want to work on it. So it's coming. Can I take this opportunity to thank Seoul and the panel and the audience for some extraordinary insights and discussion at the, at the end of this wonderful week. And uh, thank you all again for coming.